Hi, I'm Captain Jack Springle here at the Saltwater Edge, and today we're going to talk about jigging and popping. <music> jigging and popping is more than it just sounds like. I mean, jigging has been around in fishing since long before I ever even picked up a rod, and popping is something that's been around since some of the first topwater lures were ever made. But jigging and popping, which I would probably better describe as jigging and casting, or even better still, big game jigging and casting, is a facet of the sport that was driven by the advent of, well, mostly some thrill hunters, but also the advent of braided fishing line. Braided fishing line made it so that smaller tackle, more dynamic tackle could be packed full of the appropriate amount of line yardage, but also at the strength that was required. So now anglers could fill heavier duty or larger reels with couple hundred yards of 80 or 100 pound braid or even down 60 pound and it gave them a lot more opportunity to get out and cast as opposed to just trolling or baiting larger game fish with big gold reels and heavy monofilament line. Um, it's actually forced the industry as a whole to evolve because when we first started filling these reels up with braided line which was capable of handling the fish we didn't have the knots, we didn't have the terminal tackle and we most certainly didn't have reels like Shimano Stella, which now is capable of upwards of 50 plus pounds of drag. So the initial reels that we used when we first started hooking up with large game fish this way, were getting ripped off rods because the drags were melting to the reel and it would rip the guides right off. Rods were exploding in our face. And then to make rods strong enough, we would take heavy duty boat rods used for bait fishing and have custom guys put eyes on them. And when you go hook up on a fish on that, you might as well have a steel pole in your hand. It was just brutal on the body. So it's pushed the industry as a whole. And there's a lot of interesting technology here that we're gonna go over individually and as a whole, just as a general look at them and explain the difference between jigging and popping, which places much more emphasis on the angler's technique and skill, as well as the gear and the rigging. Uh, we're gonna get into all of that information here and hopefully answer all the questions you have. If the world of sport fishing were to be compared to the Olympics, jigging and popping would be the equivalent of the extreme games or the X games. It's much more physical. It requires a lot more talent at a specific technique or approach in general. And because it's such an intimate connection to these massive game fish and it's so up close and personal one on one, it's a hell of a rush. So. We're going to break down why you would go jigging and popping. But in general, if you take anything from it, it's going to elevate your traditional angling techniques just because of the technical approach to it and the, the clarity to the rigging and a lot more of the focus that you're going to put into your actual technique. One of the quickest examples I can make of that is casting. I have anglers who are outstanding surf casters or maybe they were even largemouth bass fishermen, very good anglers uh, in their facet. If I fish next to them, they'd crush me. But when they get out onto the boat, they're not familiar with the type of gear, this heavier beefed up gear the more technical aspects of the rigging, the way the knots work and the way the leaders cast. And when I get them to fish, they're breaking on the surface. They have a very difficult time putting an accurate cast on there. So one of the things I focus on right away is the, the angler themselves. You know, you, are you a good angler? Can you cast? If you can only cast over your right shoulder, it's a huge, huge handicap when it comes to targeting fish with jigging and popping. So one of the things I show people right away is just switching their elbow position. If you're constantly cast, casting with your right hands, you can just switch your elbows, still cast in the same hands you're comfortable with, but you cast over your left shoulder. Being on the wheel as much as I am in a jigging casting operation, I can cast from just about anywhere in the boat. I can point the rod butt at the sky, cast upside down. Um, I can make a cast happen from just about anywhere without having to worry about whipping a rod back. More often than not, it's a team sport. You're going to have two to three anglers casting a fish, one person on the wheel. So boat handling comes into play. You're gonna be interacting around other boats, so there's a little bit of courtesy. We're gonna get into all of that. But first thing I'd like to talk about is because braided line has pushed the technology and placed the extreme demand on the rod and reel, it's also placed that same extreme demand on the rigging and the tackle that's used. So we're gonna break down just a quick low overview of some of the tools here, and then we can get into more details or go forward. When talking tackle, we have to start off with the heart of the operation, the reel. The reel itself is basically the be all end all of the entire operation once you've hooked up on a larger game fish and is the core of the process here that's allowing us to deliver this braided line which has pushed the technology and allowed jigging and popping to become what it is today. 
you know, your investment in the tackle, you're going to get what you pay for. Uh, but a lot of the gear has caught up to the technology now. I'm a Shimano guy personally. It's what I like to use. And you can look at it from a good, better, and best scenario. A good reel to start off with if you're kind of staying on a lower budget and you want to just kind of dip your toe into it. Saragossa. Saragossa is a complete workhorse reel. It has the power with the drag. You can get up over 40 pounds of drag in the larger models and handle much larger game fish with them. They have the line capacity necessary. If you're going to be doing a lot more of it than just once in a while, you may want to invest in a reel like Twin Power. Twin Power, you can get up to a 14,000 size. It's going to have Infinity Drive on it. Infinity Drive is a really cool feature that allows you to turn the handle without having to pump the rod. That's huge with landing some of these larger game fish in the up and down. Uh, and if you want to go to the best case scenario possible, you're going to be jigging and popping almost exclusively. You're going to be putting a lot of wear and tear on your reel. You want it to last longer. You bump up to the most iconic reel in sport fishing, the Shimano Stella SW. Stella SW has infinity drive. It's got an IPX rating on it. It's completely sealed from water, inhibiting it while you're out there. If there's waves breaking on you, and, you know, you're crashing through rough water, trying to chase down tuna on the surface. And it's got heat sink. Heat sink is a feature in the reel that's going to dissipate heat from the center of the reel under that heavy drag setting and stop you from damaging your braided line. And it's also going to give you much more consistency in your drag curve coefficient. So you're not going to have inconsistency with the, the line dumping off the reel when a, a huge tuna or a really aggressive fish, maybe you're on vacation catching giant trevally or a Kubera snapper and you're worried about them getting down to the rocks. A smooth drag and control over your entire system is very important. For rods, you're going to be looking at both jigging and casting rods. And there are some specific features that you want to look at. One of the great rods, whether you're going high end, middle of the road with your reel, just an all around great rod to match with any of them are the Grappler series rods by Shimano. Also, you can look at game type J. And if you're more so oriented to topwater stick baits and poppers, you can look at the OSAF full throttle series jigging, uh, popping rods, sorry. Grappler makes rods for both casting and jigging. So the Shimano Grappler series, you will notice uh, they are high power X and spiral X. What does that mean? What makes that different than any other big game rod out there? High power X and spiral X allow a rod to be much lighter, but still super powerful. So traditionally, if you had a glass blank rod, you had to have a much thicker wall on it to make that rod be able to bend without having catastrophic hoop failure. Well, by adding high power X and spiral X, which is essentially crisscross carbon fiber tape, that reinforces the blank over the entire length of the blank. It reduce, reduces any torsion when casting, gives you a lot more control of your lures and your casting accuracy, but it also prevents catastrophic hoop failure. So now you have rods that can withstand high sticking essentially with upwards of 20 plus pounds of drag, and you're gonna be able to put the necessary pressure on fish without breaking it, but you have a, on a platform that's much lighter, much easier to work with. Uh, one of the biggest things you'll notice is that jigging rods like the grappler jigging or any jigging series rod that you decide to choose will be much shorter because you're fighting those fish and you're working your lures straight up and down in the water column you think of a basic mechanical lever with physics the longer the lever the more leverage you have if you want to move a large object far away from you a short stick will only move it so much a very long stick you have a lot more leverage you're going to be able to move that object easier well you're the object, the fish is getting the mechanical lever. So the shorter that rod is in the up and down, the better. So you want a nice rod that has a parabolic action. That means a rod that just is a nice bending line will almost bend back into the handle. There's some images here. And you also want to look into popping rods. Popping rods are going to be longer. They're usually going to be about seven and a half feet to as much as nine in most cases. I would say the average rod is between seven and a half and eight feet. There's a grappler casting series rod here. And one of the things you will notice is when I show this to people, you can look at this image here. The guide almost looks like it was wrapped backwards. You know, was the guy at the factory, you know, did he not get to sleep the night before? What happened here? There's a huge reason for that. And the number one reason for that is on a traditional guide, you have these two large legs and then one forward leg. Well, the leader systems that we use, which I'll get into in a second, have a lot of power and whipping that come off the rod and reel. There's a lot of spiral. And when you're casting the big game fish with a four ounce plug or a three ounce lure in an aggressive nature, that's very prone to catching or getting what they call a wind knot. By having the, the guide backwards, you don't have these two legs coming backwards and getting in the way for them to hang. So now that tight spiral can get pulled through the rod without hanging and giving you a wind knot or causing you to lose your plug. Once you've selected your rod and reel, you gotta put line on it and you want to use the appropriate pound test line for whatever it is you're targeting. 
if you're traveling or if you're fishing for local species here in the Northeast, um, for me locally here in the Northeast, if I'm jigging and casting, I mean, the ultimate fish for us is the bluefin tuna. I think it's the baddest fish in the world and we're lucky to have them here. But if you're willing to push out a little further or you're willing to hire one of the guides to specialize in it, you can also get a little further into the blue water. And you can also jig and cast for species like Mahi Mahi, Wahoo, White Marlin will hit top waters and jigs. Uh, you can catch swordfish on jigs if you get them up in the shallower water or you learn slow pitch or deep topping. And you can also catch uh, species like big eye tuna and yellowfin tuna as well using jigging and popping techniques. Uh, line for me locally, I'll go as light as 50 and as heavy as 100. My average line on most of my reels, I'm generally fishing uh, between a 14,000 to a 20,000 size Stella is 65 pound braid or 80 pound. My flagship line for me is 80 pound Power Pro Depth Hunter. Uh, power, there's a lot of different braided lines out there, eight carrier, 16 carrier. Um, for me, it would come down between a four carrier line like Power Pro Depth Hunter, which is essentially basic Power Pro, four carrier. What makes Depth Hunter different than most other lines is that it has a color change every 25 feet. And then every five feet, there's a black hash mark. That black hash mark's about two inches, but it allows me to drop my line very incrementally to where I'm seeing fish in the water column. The only other line choice I would use would be a hollow ace line, something spliceable, a 16 carrier hollow line that would allow me to use wind on leader systems by splicing myself. Because we're using braided line and because we're fishing for large game fish, they're gonna put a ton of pressure on your drag and these mind blowing powerful runs, one of the things you gotta do is protect yourself. So a decent pair of uh, fishing gloves, mechanics gloves. I like these gloves by AFCO. You can get a good pair of cockpit gloves, but they've got an option on them so you can still use your phone while you're out there, get a good picture, things like that. But you wanna protect your hands from the extreme power and pressure that's gonna take place under a mind blowing run. At the end of your line, you need some kind of leader system. In the very beginning, we were trying to find ways of getting heavy duty leader like 80 pound fluorocarbon to attach to braided line with a lot of limited success. We eventually settled on bimini twists, to swivels that were looped on with an offshore loop and then we'd crimp on braided line just to have something that wouldn't fail under the pressure of something like a cold water New England bluefin tuna. But over time uh, around the world people have picked up on this and little things have been taken from almost every fishery, even fly fishing, for example. Uh, I always consider the wind-on leader to be very similar to the old school tippet approach to attaching your leader systems. So you can buy pre-made wind-on leaders, and these leaders are basically hollow, a piece of hollow core braid that has a loop on one end because it's been spliced back into itself, and then it's been served into a piece of fluorocarbon. So now you can take that, tie a, a braided loop in the end of your line, and just use a simple loop-to-loop -loop connection to attach your leader system. Also, you have the option of just purchasing pre-made or pre-spooled large capacity spools of fluorocarbon leader, and you're gonna use one of the more modern knots, knots like the PR knot, the FG knot. Uh, knots like the GT knot. These are all gonna be very effective, 100% or damn near 100% break strength knots that allow you to have your leader system come on and off the guides very efficiently without hanging. Uh, you will need some additional tools to make that happen. You need to put a lot of pressure on them. In some cases, you can use gloves, but I'm a big fan of line pullers. Uh, line pullers allow you to wrap both your leader and your braid around them and seat your knots very evenly, very appropriately so that you don't have any tackle failure. One of the key things to jigging and popping is having confidence and understanding of your entire tackle system. Because you're using these wind-on leader systems and you have much heavier tackle down at the end, you need a, a method of connecting your, your leader and a method of changing out your lures very efficiently and constantly cutting away at and retying 80 and 100 pound fluorocarbon is never a good idea in general. Uh, you're gonna end up eating a lot of money up that way and you're gonna end up just getting a much shorter leader than you initially anticipated using. For me personally, if I'm making a leader system for a popping rod, I never want my leader on my reel. So in the casting position, if my plug is hanging off the tip of my rod, I like to have my leader coming up through my guides and have about an inch or two of line right where my trigger finger is for casting and that's about the length of my, my top water leader. You don't need a significantly long leader because most of that's gonna be up out of the water, just your lures working on the surface, whether it be a large sweeping popper or a technical stick bait, you know, your leader system's not down there exposed to the fish. 
Jigging is very different. Jigging, I like at least a 20 foot. And I would say there's probably nothing, no such thing as too long of a leader within practicality. But about a 20 foot leader, even in the clear water, tends to work very well for me. And that will get wound up onto the spool for a jigging system. But it's important to do that because, again, not only is your lure in the water, the entire leader system is in the water. And just like people who fish for large fish like swordfish and tuna, it's a very good idea to stretch and clean your leader system. So while you're on your way out to the tuna grounds, you, know, you don't want to open your bale and have this slinky pop off the reel and tangle up in your guides. It's very important for you to take that leader system when you're jigging and have your lure attached to a cleat somewhere, put some pressure on it, and it doesn't hurt to clean it. Uh, factories package leader, uh, many of them have holes in them. AFCO happens to do a really good job here with keeping them sealed up, but it's just human nature. You know, Once you've taken it out and you're out there, there's exhaust fumes, there's things going on that are gonna cloud up your leader. It doesn't hurt to take a little bit of alcohol, clean that leader out and stretch it. You know, the more technical and the more attention to detail you put into this game, the less you're relying on luck and the more you're reducing those little tolerances of percentages that are going to increase your chance of hooking up and landing your fish. At the end of that fluorocarbon leader, and again, you could use monofilament if you're working a top water, but I like fluorocarbon for everything. I like fluorocarbon because it's stiff, it holds its shape a little bit better, it's not as soft as monofilament, and it has better abrasion resistance. And then you get the added benefit, you know, it has that refractive index like salt water, so if you're vertical in the water column, light can pass through there. But to attach the end of that, uh, you generally will not attach directly to your lure. And one of the reasons for that is a lot of these big game fish spin around. It can put a lot of wear and tear, put a lot of twists in your leader, because again, we don't have a swivel attaching our leader system. Now it's just directly tied to the line. So you do want to try to get a swivel in line if possible. And one of the best ways to do that is to buy a high end ball bearing swivel. You'll notice when you get into the jigging popping game, you will have like bags of a lot of swivels. You start spending more money on nicely packaged individual swivels, but there's a reason for that. Don't spend the money on the gas, the boat, the Stella, and all the other gear, and then try to save money where you're connecting to the fish. You know, you wanna buy the right stuff here. To make this work, you're almost gonna create your own snap swivel system. Instead of using a snap swivel, which has a long snap to it, um, I've had big fish get leverage on that snap while fighting and pop open. You know, even an 80 pound fish could snap a 600 pound swivel open because of leverage. One of the ways to get around that, but still have the added benefit of a quick change out is to take a high end barrel swivel, like a crock. This is my favorite size is 195 pound or a size three. And you're gonna put a split ring through that. And the split ring that I use personally is an owner hyper wire number nine. I take that hyper wire number nine, I attach that through the barrel swivel like so. And then I take up the terminal end of my leader system and I just tie a Palomar knot to that. You can also do a single crimp with like a size appropriate to whatever leader you're using. If you're fishing 80 pound, you can get a small Jinkai J and crimp it on there or just pick an appropriate size crimp for the line size that you're using because you don't want any uh, slippage there if you're swaging. Uh, once you have that on the end of your line, if you want to be able to change out your lures very easily, you just get a good pair of split ring pliers and now you can use that open split ring just like a snap swivel. We'll demonstrate it. One of the systems I mentioned was our terminal system. At the end of our leader, whether it be fluorocarbon, monofilament, whatever you're using, we have this barrel swivel to a split ring. And there's a number of different advantages to that. Again, I said, if you're fishing braided line and some of these fish are taking heavy runs, casting all day, you're gonna be blowing your hands up. Uh, cuts with line, blisters, all sorts of fun stuff. So a lot of anglers will use a decent pair of gloves like these Af AFCO Relief gloves. One of the nice things about them is you've got the option on them so you can operate your phone still. If you're gonna take a quick picture, you know, something comes up you wanna get a shot of, um, or maybe you're sending a text to a buddy, let them know something's going on. But with a decent pair of split ring pliers, you can do this without having to take the gloves off. So you'll notice whenever you look, you know, you, get the, you grab your plug, you get your front of your plug. Again, this also makes it nice for grabbing lures as well without getting hung up. You can grab this off your rod and the knock on the split ring pliers will open your split ring so that you're not having to manipulate something like a snap swivel or anything like that. You open up your end of your split ring using your split ring pliers, advance that onto the plug, and you're connected. Very important thing to understand. It's very important that you buy a swivel, like this happens to be a Croc size 3 195, that your split ring can move very freely through the swivel. You don't want a larger split ring than the opening on your swivel because what will happen is you can get caught up in them and they can open. So you need that ability to slide through there very freely. Another really great advantage of this is 
traditionally, you'll find anglers will hang a hook back here behind a guide, or they'll hang their hook over here on their reel. Um, when you're spending the kind of money you're spending on a reel like the Stella, you, know, you don't really want to be beating up the rubber on your grip. You don't want this hook hitting this handle and chafing it up. You most certainly don't want the hook swinging against your lure either. I mean, swinging against your reel or swinging against your spool and damaging it or banging up your guides on your rod. A cool way to get around that is to always have a few basic, you can have heavy duty black or just basic office rigging rubber bands like these. And what you do with them is put tension on your lure by attaching the rubber band to the treble hooks. And you can either go around the handle of your reel and back onto the plug. One of the reasons I like this is it allows me to run and gun to where the fish are. I'm not going to have to worry about this making contact with my reel or my line. It's still keeping it secure from blowing around in the wind, but it's also reducing the tension at the rod tip where your leader is connected. So you won't get this kink in your leader system that you normally might if you just reeled it tight with your rod tip to the reel itself. Also reduces a lot of wear and tear right at the tip of your rod. Another cool thing about it is whether you're just heading out for the day, you're not sure what lure you're going to fish, or maybe you're not ready to fish yet, or you're heading in at the end of the day and you don't want plugs dangling everywhere, is you can take the same idea without the lure on it. Get your rubber band. You know, I'll have, if you see me on the water, I usually have like six, seven of them on my wrist at any given moment. You can use your split ring pliers, get that off there. Like so. Again, this is nice if it's cold. Gloves are protecting your hands from a lot of damage. I'll show you here because you want to make sure that that split ring and the swivel are past each other if you're going to open it. So if you grab the split ring here, you're going to end up taking your split ring off of your swivel and your lure. You want to have this on the back side of your pliers when you go to open. That's a good habit to have. Always have your swivel behind your split ring pliers so that when you go to advance this through the plug, you're not taking it off your swivel. And now you can use your rubber band in the eye of your split ring. Go back through the rubber band itself and have that same concept that you did with the lure on the handle of the rod. You can have your leader pre-tied on ahead of time and this gives you something that you can wind down to without putting too much pressure on your rod tip kinking your leader system and still has you giving you that quick interchangeability at the end of your line. When you are tying knots, it's helpful not just to rely on your pliers for cutting your leaders and your braided line. Braided line can dull scissors rapidly over time. It doesn't hurt to have a decent pair of braided scissors around as well. So something that's gonna be able to cut your line without having to put a lot of tension on it to cut it. Um, you know, Use your split ring pliers as your split ring pliers. Get a pair of scissors to do your braid cutting. Once you set up your entire system, you have your rod, your reel, you have your line on there, you've got your leader system, and you've got some interchangeability function at the end of your line so you can switch out. Again, you're going to match your lure type to the rod you're using. If you're jigging, you're going to be using jigs. If you're throwing top water, in the world of jig and pop, you're going to either be throwing a large popper, or more commonly to larger coastal pelagics up here like bluefin, you're going to be throwing more than likely some kind of stick bait to them. And the way to do that uh, is going to be to adjust a couple different things, but it's no different than if you were targeting stripers or brook trout on a fly. You want to generally match the hatch. So matching the hatch. If you have something around that looks like menhaden, you want to use a menhaden type lure. Up here in the Northeast, they could be eating half beaks or they could be eating sand eels. And if you're going to target fish, you want to focus on where those are going to be in the water column. If it's sand eels or if it's something deeper in the water column, you're going to be focused more on the jigging aspect of things. And jigs you'll notice come in a variety of different shapes. And this is one of the things about jigging and jigging and popping that make it different. Jigging is traditionally done with a, a very symmetrical, basic jig, very little action other than what you impart on it. But from the jig and pop world, you've had butterfly jigging, slow pitch jigging, a bunch of different techniques that focus on not only the depth, but the speed and the rate at which the jig is cadenced and also the way the jig falls. Lures like Shimano's new Shimmer Fall. It's a very well-rounded jig, drops very quickly, has a lot of flutter, but has a very nice walk, whether you're burning it very fast speed jig style or even something more passive like slow pitch jigging. 
Uh, a traditional style butterfly monarch is going to be very symmetrical down the center. It's going to be weighted lower. It's going to walk really good and it's going to be very good for that real flip, real flip, real flip. It's going to cause it to come up, flutter, up, flutter, up, flutter. And then more passive jigs like flat fall or slow pitch style jigs like wing fall are going to allow you to just drop into where the fish are. And they're going to be favorable more for jigging and popping from a more passive standpoint. Somebody who might not be as physical or maybe you're tired from speed jigging. I find myself personally switching it up. If they're willing to hit all three, I'll change it up just for variety and for easier on the body. Another option is more passive jigging is something like soft bait, especially if they're on sand deals, a lure, an iconic lure like the Ron Z or a weighted sluggo or whatever plastic you happen to like to use that's going to match the profile of those sand deals in the water column. Something that's going to swim, have a little bit of action without you having to work it hard or get hit on the fall. On the top water side of things, large poppers, stick baits, those are going to be your go-to. The thing is, popping in general, if you were popping for stripers or something locally, you might have pop, pop pop while you were reeling. When you're popping in the jig and pop world, it's a very tight reel to the lure coming in contact with it and a long, hard drag and sweep. And it creates more of a plunger every time you sweep. You reel in your line, plunger. It's a big stop at the end. If you do short little pops, it's often not enough to incite a strike from one of these larger, more aggressive predators. If you've ever seen a green stick offshore, they're dragging. Some of these guys have milk crates or traffic cones in the back of it, you know, or something these giant birds creating this huge disturbance. And that's what you need a lot of times to get a, a big tuna or just any kind of large game fish to come up from deeper water and, and hit a topwater plug. More On the more technical side of things, you get the stick baits. Stick baits can be something that is skidded along the surface, or it could also be a lure that's swept, where you come up, you reel tight to the lure, and you give it, again, another tight sweep, and the lure has its own action, a lipless crankbait, so to speak. They're larger baits, and more often than not, if you're buying the appropriate lure, you're going to have some kind of through wiring on them because these fish put a tremendous wear and tear, on, a heavy, heavy load on them. Um, a lot of times I like to change out the hooks to my own preference on hooks. You're going to be using anything from 2.0 to 5.0 trebles in much larger sizes. Uh, I use BKK Raptors, but you can also use uh, hooks like Owner. They make um, tin hooks like ST66, ST76. You just want to make sure you're not changing the action on your lure. So as you mess with these hooks, you can even put large singles on the back if you'd like, depending on the way the hookup is happening. When it comes to topwater fish for me, if I'm jigging and popping, I just like the sticky nature of the trebles. I'm a treble guy. But there are advantages, especially on larger game fish, if you have, you know, giant tuna, you know, something over 73 inches taking topwater baits, and maybe you just want to hook a few of them, swim them, let them go. Uh, a large single hook will purchase better in their mouth in many cases. One quick point to make about that is if your lure doesn't have the rear of its bait oriented so that the hook is facing up, then you want to add two split rings to the back of that bait. One to take the angle out so that now your J hook can sweep straight up. You want that hook coming up the back almost like a scorpion tail. That's going to give you better hookup ratio whenever you're fishing for big game fish. Um, if you do have a lure that you like to fish and it might match the size that they're eating and it's not a through wired lure, one of the easiest things you can do is attach a simple solid ring and split ring like you normally might for jigging. Uh, most jigs you'll notice have a solid ring with a, a assist hook on it. And you can take that same concept and put that on the front of any bait you have. So whether you have a bass plug or some other type of lure that isn't through wired, you can simply attach a split ring to the front of it and a, a solid ring with an assist hook. And as long as you can impart an action on that lure, now you can have that effect of that lure, but you're only fighting the fish on your terminal connection to the solid ring and the assist hook. You don't have to worry about whether or not the bait is through wired. That's why no jig ever has to be through wired because you're just fighting a fish on a two, three, 400 pound solid ring to an assist hook. A couple of other things you might wanna consider when you're investing in gear for jigging and popping. Uh, one thing would be some form of cushioning rod butt system. You're not going to be fighting these fish in a harness. As soon as you attach yourself to the rod and reel in the jig and pop world, you're at a big disadvantage. If a fish sounds under the boat and your rod is attached to something you know, locked against your body, you can't really move. So I like to use something like a soft cushion system, something like a Scotty hammerhead or a cushion, something on the end of that rod that can put against your body, allow you to position appropriately to put the leverage on the fish, but you're not going to be locked into it. Other considerations for tying knots like the FG or the PR bobbin is to get yourself a decent PR bobbin tool in addition to just a set of line pullers. 
And one of the other cool little tricks that you can use to hack almost everything while you're out there is a basic set of simple rubber bands. These simple rubber bands will allow you to do a lot of different tricks with the terminal rigging and baits on the lures that will reduce any kind of likelihood of damage happening to your plug or damage happening worse to your rod and reel from your plug because these big trebles are swinging around while you're running and gunning at some of these fish on the surface. So that covers most of the gear you can come here at the Saltwater Ridge and find to get you started to go for jigging and popping, whether it be for tuna, mahi-mahi, or maybe you're going on a trip somewhere. The next breakdown of series, we're gonna go into some of the how-tos. We're gonna break down how to approach jigging, how to approach stick baits and popping.